Good morning, Good morning and welcome to North Church. We're so excited that you've decided to join us this morning. My name is Amy Moffitt. And I'm Sawyer Wilson. And I'm excited to be here with you. Beat you to it. <laughs> she says that every time she's got somebody different. Hey, you got the better looking, much cooler, much funnier Wilson brother this week. You had my baby brother last week and now it's me. The and real I, deal. I have no idea how to respond to that except to say that I love both Wilson brothers. Yes. It's so Come on. great to we be We love you. you. <laughs> well, if you're joining us online, I want to say welcome to church. We're so excited that you're with us. We would love to know where you're watching and who you're watching with. One of my favorite things is to see pictures yeah. of people enjoying our worship experience from all over the place. Pretty so cool. take a picture, put it on your social media, tag North Church so we can check it out. For all of you in our lobby, I want to encourage you to grab your coffee and head on in because we're about to kick off Revival Part 2. Week 1, Part That's 2. Right. This is crazy because we had a different speaker on Thursday night. We got a new speaker today. That's right. Thursday night, we had Pastor Woo! Al Toledo from so Chicago. Good. It was amazing. Today, we've got Manny Arango, and he's bringing the energy and the passion. Miss Amy, did you have a takeaway from Al's message on Thursday night? I did. I think my favorite thing he said was, God fills those who are ready to fulfill his so good. purposes. So good. So good. How about you? What was yours? Uh, my favorite takeaway was honestly just his emphasis on prayer yeah. and treating the night like a prayer meeting. It it so was good. incredible. He's a prayer warrior. He so is. it was a lot, a lot of fun. Hey, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning. We've got two more speakers coming up after today That's right. for Revival. Next Thursday night, we've got Chet Pete. It's going to be awesome. And then Friday, we've got the Revival regular, Mr. Greg Ford That's himself. Right. It's going to be awesome. And sandwiched in there, we've got Night of Worship right. on Friday, August 5th here at North Church, or you can join us online. And we've actually got a special guest, a guy that you know. I know him well. Yeah. His name is David Suey. Many of you know him too. He is going to be leading us in a night of worship on August 5th yeah. at 7 p.m. at our Oklahoma City location, or you can join us on Facebook as well. It's going to be incredible. Something incredible that we have been doing. Come on. And today is the last day. It's our Bible translation challenge. Yep. We decided in the month of July to raise $100,000 to help Illuminations translate the Bible for the people of Gabon. They have two heart languages and we are going to get the Bible translated for those yes. people. We are on track. Not there. Not quite. But today is the day. Today is the day. And I'm excited because today in our experience, Pastor Rodney's going to give us a progress right. update on meeting our goal. Miss Amy knows because she handles the money, that but we don't it. know. So stay tuned for that update from Pastor. If you want to help us meet that Bible translation goal, of course you can give. But if it's your first time or first time in a while, you can fill out a North card. There's one in the seat back near you or you can go to northcard.me if you're watching online. When you do that, we're gonna do a $10 donation to Illuminations on your behalf. Help us meet that Bible translation goal. And also, just to say thank you to you, we're gonna give you a $10 Chick-fil-A gift card. Come on. That's right. If you are in the house, I wanna encourage you to take that North Card to our connections area. They are incredible. And the friendliest they, people you'll ever meet. They are the yeah. friendliest people, <laughs> and they love to meet new people. So take that card to them. If you have any questions, just ask them and I promise you, they will know the answer. Well, like I said, we are in revival. It is. And it continues on Thursday night and Sunday morning. This is one of those times at North Church where you do not want to miss Thursday night or Sunday morning. The experiences are different. different. Normally it's the same, but this next week, different experience on Thursday than on Sunday. Tell us who's talking on Thursday. So this Thursday, we've got Chet Pete. Yep. He's been here, but it's been a little while. Yep. So he's going to be new to a lot of us. So be ready for that. Bring a friend. And then Sunday morning, we've got Greg Ford. He's been with us for our past two revivals, I yep. think. And I'm excited to hear him bring the word. That's it's exactly going to be awesome. Right. Hey, whether you're in the room or online, I want to encourage you, grab your phone. You got about 45 seconds till worship begins and go on Facebook, go on YouTube, share the live stream, hit the like button, hit the heart and tag a friend in the comments so they can join us for revival today. Yeah, I'm not sure they're listening because I don't see anyone taking out their phone. That's okay, I did it, I did it. You did it? Okay, okay yeah. good, 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 good. <laughs> well, if you're joining us online, you can also share our experience. If you're on Facebook, just click the share button in the left corner and let people know. If you're in the house, check in, let people know where you are. I promise you, you're gonna hear some great things that you're gonna wanna share with other people. Well, wherever you are, I am so excited that we are kicking off part two of revival. So wherever you are, stand with us as we go into our time of worship. Good morning, Lord Church. This is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Our God is victorious. He is for us. And so he will never fail. Hold on to that word today that he will not fail you. He will never fail. 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 
God, turn it around. Going Guthrie, Oklahoma City, Mabel Bassett, Freedom House, Lexington. I want us to say that together, but I want to say it without being said verbally. I want you to say it inside of you. Just, just whisper that to yourself right now. Say it right now. God, turn it around. Inside of you. Don't, no, I don't want to hear the words inside of you. Come a little louder. Just inside of you. Now I want you to do this. Now I want you to whisper that so that the person next to you can hear it. Just, just the person next to you. God, turn it around. Say it again. God, turn it around. One more time. God, turn it around. Now, now I want you to raise that level of volume, just a normal speaking, and say, God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. And the reason why I'm having you to say that again and again is because sometimes we got to remind ourselves of what God can do. Whatever it is that you are facing right now, my God can turn it around. Whatever it is that you seem like you've prayed about again and again and again, my God can turn it around. No matter what you or somebody has said and spoken over you, my God can turn it around. No matter what you feel in your body, my God can turn it around. Do you believe that? Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you on three to yell it out, God, turn it around. One, two, three. God, turn it around. One more time. One, two, three. God, turn it around. Come on now, lift your hands toward heaven and say, God, you can turn it around. It's in your hands. You can do more with it than the doctor can. You can do more than a psychologist can. You can do more with it than a banker can. You can do more with this than anyone else because nothing is too hard for you. You are more than able hallelujah to God be the glory I believe today is going to be a turnaround day for many people that are right now listening in let's act on the Word of God today so we're in revival if you did not get a chance to be here Thursday which you didn't <laughs> go listen to that message what an amazing word and then, and then this next coming week, it's going to be incredible. Thursday night, you know, we have our Thursday night every single week for the last seven years. It's the start of our weekend experiences. And then we have here in Oklahoma City uh, services and also in Guthrie, we have a Thursday night. And then we also have the weekend experiences. But let me just say, next week we have Check Pete. So be there in Guthrie, be there in Oklahoma City Thursday night. And then next Sunday, uh, for all experiences, we have 
Greg Ford. Um, these individuals are a part of this house. They've been here multiple times. They offer an incredible voice of God from God to us. And so come expecting great things. But, to, but I, I want to say before we move on that we've been doing this month a Bible translation. And we've been giving toward illuminations. And we'd set a goal of $100,000. Now, over the past three years, we have given to Bible translation as a church over $800,000 to date. Isn't that good? We're specifically, right now we're specifically focusing on the translation of the Word of God into the heart language of two um, groups of people in the country of Gabon, West Africa. And so it's a small country, but we, are, we believe that every single group of people on the face of this planet needs to have God's Word in their heart language. How about that? If you only had access into a language that you did not even know, how difficult would that be but to have it in your heart language? And so we've been doing that. For the month of July, we've set a goal of $100,000. We have had well over 200 plus families, like 220 families that have, that's a lot of people that have contributed. There's many more that still haven't. And today is the last day of this. You can give toward it. But as of right now, our goal is $100,000. We're setting at $87,000 plus dollars. Come on, to God be the glory. So just ask God about what you'll do. It's not coercion. We're not forcing you. But we're just asking you to ask God and then obey what the Holy Spirit speaks into your heart to give. Now today we have as our speaker, Manny Arango. And I'm telling you, he's been in the house before. I love to hear him preach. He is a, a great preacher of the Word of God. He's very gifted. He's a wonderful communicator. Go back into, his, his, into the uh, lobby if you're in Oklahoma City. If not, you can go online at different locations and check out the resources that are available. And he is just a wonderfully gifted individual. But more than anything, I'm impressed with his authenticity, his ability to be able to just talk to anyone, to love on them well. He's a lover of God, and he loves the people of God. And I want you to give it up right now to a friend of mine, a guest of this house, Manny Arango, as he comes and preaches the Word of God. Would you do it? Come on, give it up! I'm honored that you would clap for me, but come on, how many people know if it had not been for the grace and the mercy of God? Come on, on your side. Oh, come on, I need a better praise than that. Has God been good to you? Has God been good to you? Come on, how many people acknowledge that God's been amazing before I have you sit down? I was in worship, and I want to encourage us around this thought, even as an extension of worship and praise. I was researching for a totally different sermon and was studying the woman with the issue of blood. Anybody familiar with this woman in the, in the Bible? Uh, and with the woman with the issue of blood, if she had been alive today, with all of the modern medicine that we have available today, she actually would have been able to live for decades, like with her hemorrhaging issue. But actually in the first century, without modern medicine, this issue would have gotten like an 18 month diagnosis to live. So the first time she started bleeding and hemorrhaging, doctors would have said, hey, you got 18 months max. Everybody say max. max. 18 months max to live. Get your affairs in order. I don't know if anybody's read the Bible recently, but she lived a little longer than 18 months with this condition. Actually, she made it into two years, three years, four years, five years, six, seven years, eight years. Nine years, she made it a whole decade alive with an issue that they said she would have died from in 18 months. And baby, guess what? 11 years. By the time she gets to Jesus, she has been living with this condition for 12 long years. And some of us, we only praise God at the end once we've gotten healed. But can I tell you this? The same God that heals you in year 12 is the same God that's been sustaining you on year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. You know, 
I hope that I'm not preaching to spoiled Christians today. You know, spoiled. God, you haven't healed me, so I'm going to give you some half-hearted worship today. I wonder if I'm preaching to people who are saying, he may not have healed me, but I'm still alive. He may not have healed me yet, but he has been sustaining my life. He hasn't healed me yet, but there's breath in my body. And the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. I wonder, is there anybody with breath today? Who's saying, God, I realize you're not my Santa Claus. You're not my genie. You're God. And on my worst day, you've still been better than good to me. It's funny, I was, you know, studying for this sermon. I'll preach it at some point. <laughs> Just studying, you know. And uh, I, I thought I had the message kind of neat and tidy. And I said, yeah, you know, this is the woman who's been suffering for 12 years. And the Holy Spirit corrected me. Holy Spirit checked me and said, no, she hadn't been suffering for 12 years. She survived for 12 years. Can I encourage you today? You didn't just suffer through a divorce. You survived the divorce. You didn't just suffer through bankruptcy. You survived bankruptcy. You didn't just suffer through COVID. You survived COVID. We didn't just suffer through a pandemic. We survived a pandemic. We, we have survived. I wonder if I'm talking to any survivors today. Oh, come on. Am I talking to any survivors today? I'm not a victim. Oh, no, I'm a survivor. I'm an overcomer. Oh, come on. I'm the head only and not the tail. I'm above only and never beneath. Come on. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So come on. With arms lifted towards heaven, God, we thank you. We thank you for all of your benefits towards us. God, we just want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And someone may hear me saying thank you and think I'm repeating myself. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm saying, God, thank you for waking me up this morning. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. God, thank you for healing people in my family. Thank you in advance for what you're going to do today. God, we lift you up. We put a demand on heaven's supply. And God, we thank you that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are. You inhabit the praises of your people. So God, we release you to do what only you can do today. Come on, in Jesus' name, we praise. Can somebody say hallelujah? Come on, you can grab your seat. My name is Manny Arango, and I'm black. For anyone who did not notice when I walked up here, I am blackity black, okay? I'm black every day of the week, okay? And uh, that means I grew up preaching at a black church. Everybody say black church? Uh, which means there's no ambiguity or confusion when you're preaching at a black church, whether or not you're doing a good job or a bad job. Sometimes I'll preach at, you know, some churches that are a little bit more vanilla than chocolate, and uh, people will come up to me in the lobby afterwards like, you did an amazing job, and I'll be like, I couldn't tell. <laughs> Felt like a library in the sanctuary, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but if you're preaching in a black church, there's no confusion whether or not you're doing a good job or a bad job. If you're doing a bad job, everybody say bad job. If you're doing a bad job, that means your jokes ain't funny. Uh, that means you should have prayed more about the message. Uh, church mama, who's typically sitting in this section over here, church mama ain't never been to seminary, but she know when she hear heresy, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so if you're doing a bad job, if you're doing a bad job, church mama at the church I grew up at will stand up and say, help him, Holy Ghost. <laughs> you're not even mad at the church mama. You're like, you know what? I'm going to add my faith to the church mama's faith. Like, Holy Ghost, please help me. You know what I'm saying? However, if you're preaching good, and we all know what good preaching is, you know, that means a sermon will make you cry and laugh at the same time, right? Uh, a good sermon is like a Disney movie, right? Kids like it, adults like it, everybody likes it, right? Uh, it brings the right level of conviction, not condemnation. Uh, it's encouraging and challenging simultaneously. You open up the word of God for people, and people get to feast on what the word of the Lord is saying. If you're preaching good at a black church, that same church mama that would have said, help him, Holy Ghost, like the week before, will begin to say things like, boy, you better preach. Let's go. Say it again for the folks in the back. Okay, then, okay. And a good church mama, my favorite thing that a church mama will say is this, take your time, preacher. Take your time, okay? So we're gonna make an agreement. I need, I need us to make an agreement, okay? You about to act as black as possible, you didn't know when you woke up today you was going to be black at church, okay? You're going to be as black as possible today, okay? You're going to holler back at me, and I'm going to be as white as possible, and I'm going to preach this in 32 minutes. 
in 36 seconds. Because the black church I grew up at didn't have no timer in the back, okay? Uh, <laughs> pastor just preached. They just preached till the sermon was over, you know what I'm saying? Uh, so here we go. We're going we to make an agreement. We're going to make an agreement. And I don't know if you had a mama like mine. My mama would always say, you know, if she felt like I was crying for no reason, she would say, you either stop crying or I'm going to give you something to we had a same mama. That's crazy. We had a same mama, okay? Uh, I used to, I used to tell people all the time, hey, look, uh, if, if I'm preaching and you acting bored, uh, you better either stop acting bored or I'm going to give you something to be bored about. I will bust open Leviticus in a heartbeat, okay? I'll just start reading through Levitical laws. You'll hate it. I'll love it. But hey, uh, no, for real, I'm excited to be giving the word. I'm from Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm a teaching pastor at a church in Dallas called Social Dallas, and uh, Pastor Robert Madu is my pastor, and uh, I'm so excited uh, to be in the house with you today. Anybody love Pastor Rodney and Shannon Fouts? Anybody? Just me? I love you, pastors. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for all the kindness and the hospitality. Thank you for the warmth. Uh, I was here months ago, and I think your first time preaching somewhere, you're a guest. Second time, your family. And so um, thank you for all the faith and the integrity that it takes offstage um, to actually do this. Sometimes when people walk into an amazing church, what they see is this. What they don't see is the prayer life. What they don't see is a sacrifice. But thank you so much for being faithful in private so that there can be a public church that looks good to the world so that we can win souls and evangelize. And uh, so thank you. We love you. Uh, come on, am I the only one that loves your pastor? Remember, we black today, okay? So come on, loud. Uh, and here's the deal. We don't say amen for the preacher's ego. That's not the, that's not the point. It's because the power of life and death is in your tongue. And if somebody's preaching about peace and you know you had a panic attack on the drive here, that's not the place for the enemy to make you feel awkward and quiet and silent. No, that's actually where you say amen the most. Because you're saying, so let it be in my life. We say amen, not just in reality. We say amen in faith. We say amen because we speak those things that be not as though they were. Come on, I've said amen about some things that I knew weren't true in my life right then. But because I said amen, they became true in my life. And I need a good amen right there. I think there's a picture of my wife. I've been married since 2014. That's my girl. I call her my black girl magic. She's my personal Black girl magic. You don't know what that is. Google it, okay? Uh, and we have an amazing son. I think there's a picture of my wife and my son. There we go. That's my guy. He's one years old. And uh, quick testimony. Doctor said we would never get pregnant. Uh, uh, anytime there's an infertility issue, we walked through infertility for five years. Anytime there's an infertility issue, there's a 50-50 chance on which person is kind of the root of the issue, you know? In church, sometimes we have a stigma that it's always the woman. But in me and my wife's case, it was me. The doctors did a whole bunch of diagnostics on me, and I had no sperm, none. You don't know what sperm is? Google that after church. <laughs> um, um, normal sperm count was like 40 million, and I had less than 10. Not 10 million, like just 10, <laughs> okay? Effectively, I had no sperm. We weren't even eligible to do IVF, and so that little boy right there is a miracle. Uh, if you don't believe in miracles, let me tell you that you're currently looking at someone who doctor said needed a sperm donor, who doctor said needed to adopt, and I have a biological son who acts like me, okay? Looks like his mama, acts like me. Ain't that a handsome boy? Oh, that black boy is handsome. I love me some him. I love that boy. Uh, he just turned a year old, and uh, I, get to, I, get, I go home tonight, and I'll catch bath time tonight. Okay, uh, so let's go to the Bible. Come on, who's ready for a word? Who's ready for the word? If you're ready for the word, grab a Bible. Grab a Bible. We're going to go to Genesis chapter 29. Genesis chapter 29, and I believe that I have a word for you uh, this morning, a word to encourage you, a word to challenge you. Genesis chapter 29. We can go ahead and put it on the screen. Uh, it says this, uh, then Jacob said to, oh, come on, we black, come on. If I point the mic at you, that's your turn to talk, okay? Then Jacob said to, give me my... My time is completed, and I want to make love to her. Not necessarily what I would say to my father-in-law, but you know, Jacob, do your thing. Okay, next verse. Uh, so Laban brought together all of the people of the place. and gave a feast. 
Uh, this next part is going to be an uh, interesting detail. We need to remember this. But when evening came, evening is important because there, Thomas Edison had not invented the light bulbs. There's no electricity, okay? When it's dark, it's dark, okay? Uh, this is imperative for the trick that Laban is going to play on Jacob. He took his daughter, who? And brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to her. Next verse. When morning came, uh, oh, and, and Laban gave his servant Zilpah, okay? When morning came, there was? So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? I served you for who? Why have you deceived me? I, I want to camp out right here just for a little bit. I'm not going to preach on this long, but can I preach a little bit? Can I preach a little bit? Jacob is saying, why have you what? Deceived me. I, I want to preach just a little bit right here because sometimes we can be so distracted by the flesh and blood evil that we can see in our face that we forget that there is actually a God that's presiding over every single circumstance and every single scenario. Here's what Jacob knows. What Jacob knows is that Laban has tricked him. Laban has deceived him. He's worked for Rachel. He's in love with Rachel. And Laban has let the, 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 the darkness of nightfall on the wedding night and tricked him to marrying and consummating with Leah instead of Rachel. What Jacob knows is that Laban is shady. That's what Jacob knows. What Jacob doesn't know is that Laban's deception leads to him marrying Leah. Leah's fourth son is going to be a boy by the name of Judah. And if you read the genealogies in the Bible, Jesus comes from the line of Judah. This is so important in the Bible that Revelation calls Jesus the lion of the tribe of Judah. Can I help somebody today? <laughs> Laban may be there to deceive you, but God is in control of the whole scenario. So that what Joseph says to his brothers is always true. What you meant for evil, God meant it for good, for the saving of many souls. Am I preaching to anybody who's saying, I'm not gonna be angry and bitter. I'm not gonna let resentment dominate how I think. Because get this, Rachel is who Jacob wanted. Leah is who Jacob needed. Ooh. And God allows Laban to trick and deceive Jacob because sometimes you don't even know what you need because you are distracted by how beautiful the things are that you want. Come on, give me the next verse. We're going to keep preaching. We're just reading the Bible. We're just reading the Bible. Is this helping anybody already? Laban replied, it is not our here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Bro, you should have told me that. <laughs> Finish this daughter's bridal week, then we will give you the younger one also. Hashtag Old Testament. <laughs> or Utah. <laughs> in return for another seven years of work. Verse 28. And Jacob did so. He finished the week with who? And then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Next verse. Laban, Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. And then verse 30. Here we go. Jacob made love to Rachel also. And his four was what? Greater than his love for Leah. I, I need us to camp out right here. Because these are two sisters. And these are actually a picture of the fork in the road that a lot of us are in right now. One sister is beautiful. Oh, she's drop dead gorgeous. She's so beautiful that it stops Jacob in his tracks. He falls in love at first sight and he is the one that agrees. It's his idea to work for seven years for this woman because he is so awestruck by her outward beauty. What he doesn't know is that she's outwardly beautiful but inwardly barren. Outwardly beautiful and her barrenness is actually a symptom of her spiritual and em emotional emptiness. Let's talk about Rachel for a little bit. I'm a, I'm a millennial, and you know, uh, we would call her a baddie. She an Instagram baddie, you know what I'm saying? What Jacob don't realize is that she a baddie, but she also bad for Jacob. <laughs> she bad, like in bad, good, but she also bad like bad. <laughs> At one point in the story, she steals her father's household gods. 
Now imagine me and you go to, you know, lunch, and we go to a Thai restaurant, and I steal the Buddha. You'd be a little weirded out by that, because you'd be thinking to yourself, I thought Pastor Manny was a Christian. Why he's stealing the Buddha? <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> so why? So Rachel steals her household gods. Why? Because she's an idol worshiper. It's not that, not that confusing, actually. Her heart is not fully devoted to Yahweh. Moreover, I think I'm going to get maybe two amens from at least two dudes in the room. The Bible's entertaining, y'all. You think the Bible's boring? You've been reading the wrong book. Laban comes out to confront her about stealing the household gods. Homegirl has put the household gods on a camel. She has sat on the camel, and she got the nerve to say, you can't check the camel because I'm on my period. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and say, any woman who's lying about her period, I just don't think she can be trusted, okay? <laughs> so not only, I told you, the Bible's entertaining. I didn't make this up. This is, this is, in, the whole, this is in the Bible. <laughs> She's an idol worshiper. She's a liar. Every single time they can't get pregnant, she blames Jacob for why they can't get pregnant, which means she's emotionally manipulative. Whew. But remember... She's cute. <laughs> Attractive, beautiful, cute, but toxic. Dysfunctional. Insecure. Genesis chapter 49 actually gives us a good little detail. I couldn't go here the last service, but we're going to go here this service. You good with that? Come on, Genesis chapter 49. If you can give me Genesis chapter 49. It says this. The he here is Jacob. Then Jacob gave them these instructions. I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave in the field of Ephraim the Hittite. Let me stop right there. See, Jacob is an old man here in Genesis chapter 49. We read Genesis chapter 29 a little while ago, and decades of life have passed. How many people know what you find attractive when you're older versus what you find attractive when you're young and stupid? Totally different. What you find attractive when you're healed versus what you find attractive when you're not healed, totally different. What you find attractive before you come to Jesus and what you find attractive after you come to Jesus, totally different. Okay, come on. I'm just preaching a little bit. Here we go. Jacob is on his deathbed with more wisdom than he had when he initially found love with Rachel. And he says this, the field in the cave of the field of Machpelah near Mamre and Canaan, which Abraham brought as a with a field along to the burial place from Ephron the Hittite. He's giving them instructions for where to bury him. Get this next little detail. I need the next verse. There we go. There Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. And there I buried Leah. You want to know what happens to Rachel when she dies? They bury her in an unmarked grave in the middle of the desert. Because she was cute, <laughs> but problematic. By the end of Jacob's life, he decides to be buried with the woman that he actually needed all along. Because God doesn't always give you what you want, but God gives you the stuff that you need. And the question is this, are you mature enough? Do you have the eyes of faith to not just see what's in front of you, but to see the potential of what lives inside the thing that God gave you? I don't just want to be so distracted by the perfection or the beauty of the thing that I want. I want to be able to see beneath the surface what's beneath the iceberg to be able to see what's really there. Holy Ghost, give me eyes of faith so that I can see the potential of what's inside of things. So here's the question. Here's the question. See, Rachel is beautiful but barren. Leah ain't cute. Now, you know you're not cute when the Bible says you're not cute. That's a whole other level of not cute, right? Imagine me and Pastor Rodney giving a single guy advice, and we're just kind of like, hey, you know, you, you think she's cute. I don't know. You know, if you like her, we love her, you know? It's a whole other thing altogether for Moses to be writing the Pentateuch under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost and for him to get to Genesis chapter 29 and the Holy Ghost go, hey, bro, remember to tell him Leah had a lazy eye. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's a whole, 
It's a whole other level of like not cute. <laughs> Leah's not cute, but she's fruitful. Not cute, but emotionally stable. Not cute, but is able to get married off to someone that she did not choose and still not give that dude no problems. Ooh. Whoo! We don't talk about Leah a lot, but it takes a lot to be Leah. Leah ain't cute, but every couple years, homegirl's not having another baby. Simeon, Reuben, Levi, Judah. I mean, Leah ain't cute, but homegirl is fruitful. And you want to know what I have found? Most Christians are stuck between being attracted to stuff that's not fruitful and totally turned off by things that are completely fruitful. Because prayer is not attractive, but it's fruitful. Reading your Bible every day is not attractive, but it's fruitful. Confrontation is not attractive, but it's fruitful. And a lot of times we want the stuff that looks perfect, but the stuff that looks good ain't always good for us. Meanwhile, God will bury stuff with tons of potential and wrap it in drama, put it right in front of you to see whether or not you want stuff for your own desires or if you see stuff with the eyes of faith. Can I help us today? If you are going to be someone who prioritizes fruitfulness over attraction, this is not even just about relationships. Because come on, my first house, that thing was Aaliyah. First piece of property me and my wife bought, that house was ugly. But guess what? I made over $100,000 when I sold it because it wasn't pretty, but it was attractive. And I, I have friends, no shade. Their apartment is dope. Real cute. But they wasting money every month and building no equity. Oh boy, I'm stepping on toes. Here we go. I've got friends that are my age where me and my wife decided to buy an ugly house and build wealth. They decided to get a dope apartment. They joined, theirs looks better than ours, but my bank account looked better than theirs. Uh-oh, not a lot of amens. Here we go, not a lot of amens. What looks good ain't always good. And sometimes we are so drawn to things that look good that we actually neglect and forsake the stuff that is good. If you are going to prioritize fruitfulness, then I've got to give you five seeds that you're going to have to manage because it's seed that produces fruit. If you are going to be fruitful, everybody say fruitful, then you have to be good at managing what? Seed. There's no point in you complaining about the fruit growing in somebody else's life when you've got the seed to produce that same fruit. Five seeds that everybody has. And the key word here is everybody. Because the voice of the enemy will tell you that they have something you don't have. There's always a they, someone you're comparing yourself to. That they've got something that you don't have. If I had the family they came from, if I had, if I had the job they had, if I had the spouse they had. No, 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 no. You have everything you need to fulfill your purpose for your life. God has given you every seed you need. The question here is whether or not you're going to plant it cultivate it and grow everything that God has given you. Can we go a little deeper? I heard in church a lot that God put Adam and Eve in a perfect garden. Can I tell you? That is not true. The Bible never says that the garden of Eden is perfect. Here's what the Bible says. On day one, two, three, four, five, and six of creation that God said it is good. Which means God don't give you a perfect spouse. He gives you a good spouse. And it's your job to compliment them, affirm them, challenge them, encourage them, praise them, roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, and create greatness out of what is good. God don't give you perfect kids. He gives you good kids. And it's your job to prophesy over them, read the word to them, know the word, plant seeds in them, and cultivate them into great kids. If you're an entrepreneur in the room, God don't send you perfect employees. He sends you good employees. God don't even send you great stuff. Why? Because a perfect garden would have made Adam and Eve lazy. He puts them in the garden and he gives them a command. Work it. 
work it, cultivate it, be faithful. And if we are going to be people who are fruitful, then we've got to learn how to manage what? Seed. How, what are we going to manage? Seed. If we're going to be fruitful, then we have to manage seed. Seed number one, your words. Your words. Every word that comes out of your mouth is a seed that you are sowing. Your words don't leave your mouth. Your words are actually going into your future, and you are going to reap the words you speak. Me and my wife, we struggled with infertility for five years. Neither me or her ever said the words, we are infertile. Why would I make a bad situation worse? I need you to get this. Because the situation's already bad. There's already a diagnosis of cancer. Why would you make it worse? There's already an issue in your marriage. You don't like your spouse. Okay, great. But maybe your spouse is a fulfillment of the words. Ooh, you don't like me. You ain't gonna like me. You ain't gonna like me. For the last 10 years, you've been saying you sloppy. Now you mad they sloppy. They were sloppy. You decided instead of checking your mouth to confess sloppiness over them, now you've been married for 20 years and you mad they sloppy. That's called a self-fulfilled prophecy. Ooh. Uh-oh. This is preaching. This is good preaching. Butt cheeks are clenched. I'm stepping on toes. You feel uncomfortable. I know you feel uncomfortable. Here we go. You have to begin to ask yourself, am is, are my words actually changing things? Because get this, you don't lose anything by speaking by faith. You lose nothing. There's never been a season in my life where the words that I've spoken that have gotten me to the next level didn't make me feel like I was a liar. Pastor Ronnie, I was telling people for years, yeah, 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 I'm going to be a dad soon. It would confuse people because they knew we were walking through infertility. They would say, is your wife pregnant? I'd have to go, not that I know of, not yet. But Jesus said he was coming back soon, and it's been 2,000 years. So if Jesus can say soon, baby, guess what? I can say soon. I'm going to be a father soon. I'm going to speak this into existence. I'm going to, I, we picked out baby names when doctors were saying we would never have children. We took all the computers in the house, every laptop, every computer, and made the password my baby's names. Why? Because I never wanted to forget the desire that was on the inside of me. Why would I act like I don't want what I want? God will give me the desires of my heart, but if I act like I don't even want it, I'm going to keep speaking death and negativity. Every time people came to us like, when y'all going to have kids? Because you know church people. Love asking people, when y'all going to have kids? The enemy wanted me to say, no, we're enjoying our life right now. You know, we, get, we like the freedom. That would have been a lie. Every single time somebody asked me, are you guys going to have kids? I'd be like, hey, actually, we're struggling with infertility. I need you to speak life. And if anybody started speaking death, I'd be like, okay, I can love you, but from over there. Because words means this, that I begin to take inventory over the words I say but then I don't allow any unauthorized person to sow seed into my life. Because words is a two-way street. Ooh. Your ears is actually the top of the soil of your soul. See, Pastor Rodney can preach faith every week. He can deposit faith seed into your life every single week. And he faithfully does. He can deposit faith seed. Anybody who invites to preach, they can deposit faith seed. But if you talk to your church hurt uncle, on Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday. And he church hurt. He ain't been in church in 15 years. He thinks preachers are stealing money. He don't believe in tithing. You know what I'm saying? He been hurt. And now Pastor Rodney gets 90 minutes of seed sowing into your life. But your church hurt uncle gets 10 hours a week into your ear. Then it's not really all that confusing why there's more doubt fruit in your life than faith fruit in your life when the dominant seed sower should be your pastor. Not all that confusing if you let someone who's not your spouse sow seed of compliments. Oh, you look good. Have you been working out? You, uh, your beard looks nice on you. I will shut that down in a heartbeat. Hey, you're my admin. You're not here to compliment me. You can keep that to yourself. 
Because it's not going to be all that confusing why there's fruit of attraction when I've been letting you compliment me for three years. Oh, boy. Especially if your love language is words of affirmation and you don't get it from your husband. Uh Uh-oh. I'm helping you. I'm helping. I'm, I'm preaching. See, I'd rather be rude and stay married. Then nice to my admin, but then I'm, I, I, I lose my wife after the first 10 years of marriage. I'd rather shut it down. Hey, I don't really need you to, I don't, I don't need you to, yeah, just do your job. And then work with my wife. Hey, my love language is words of affirmation. I need you to compliment me. I need you to talk to me a little bit more. I'd rather fix the person who should be sowing seed than get it elsewhere. And most of us, we letting people scratch itches for us and then confused as to why we formed attachments with people who we used as substitutes to scratch the itch that really your pastor should be scratching and your spouse should be scratching. Oh, I'm preaching good. At some point, you're going to have to take inventory over the words you speak, but you're also going to have to put a fence up and a gate up around your garden of your soul so that nobody who's unauthorized will sow seed. I'm only on number one. Oh my gosh. Got six minutes left. Let's go. Number two. Number two, tears. Tears, number two. We're going to get through all five, and I'm going to do it in six minutes. Watch this. Holy Ghost, help me. I need a church mom to say, help him, Holy Ghost. Come on. (laughs) Tears. Give me Psalm 126. Those who, with what? Will reap with songs of joy. You can give me the the next verse. Those who go out weeping, carrying what? Seed to sow will return with songs of joy, carrying seeds with them. I was at a youth event one time. I was a youth pastor for about 10 years, and this girl came run up to the stage, won a prayer, and she's just crying. Hey, Brother Manny, I, I love my boyfriend so much. I love him. I've been trying to break up with him. I broke up with him like three times. We've been dating for like four or five years. I love him. He ain't saved. He ain't a Christian. I know I should be dating him, but I love him so much. She's just crying. And I went, wow, you double sowing. You saw in words and tears. Because the world tells you if you cry, you'll get over it. The Bible tells you if you cry, you'll stay tethered to it. Oh, I'm helping you. I'm helping you. Because you don't just reap what you sow, you reap where you sow. When's the last time you cried over unsaved people? When's the last time you cried over a tribe in West Africa that doesn't have a translation of the Bible? When's the last time you cried over your church hurt uncle who may spend an eternity separated from God if he don't get his happy hips back in church? When's the last time you cried about that? When's the last time you cried in God's presence? Because God says to the prophet Samuel, how long will you mourn over Saul? Since I have rejected him as king. If you are a believer, you are not allowed to just cry about the stuff you care about. You're actually been assigned to sow the seed of tears over the stuff God cares about. And if God don't care about it, if it don't break his heart, I'm going to say it's not going to break my heart. And if it does break his heart, I'm going to allow it to break my heart because my tears are not just moisture leaving my eyeballs. My tears is seed that I'm sowing in my prayer closet. Seeds that I'm sowing in my life. Oh, I need a good amen in church. Culture teaches you the exact opposite. Just be authentic. Be yourself. I mean, you have to express how you feel. The Bible don't say none of that. The Bible says crucify your flesh. The Bible says die to yourself. The Bible says be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The Bible don't say be the best version of you. The Bible say be like Jesus. That's what the Bible says. At some point, we got to stop looking like and sounding like our culture and begin to say, you know what? What does the Bible actually say? Number three. Time. Time. Every single one of us has the same 24 hours in the day. Now get this. Woo! I'm going to challenge you. Because if you are all caught up on everything on Netflix, Hulu, Hulu Plus, Disney Plus, Paramount, uh, I'm running out of so many streaming services at this point, all your favorite YouTubers. You all caught up on all of that. But Barna says that 96% of Christians have never read the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, you ain't never read the Bible. I ain't going to make you raise your hand. 
I will not embarrass you. That only 4% of Christians have read the entire Bible. Do you want to know how many minutes per day it takes you to read the Bible just to finish the whole Bible in one year? 12 minutes. 12 minutes of sacrifice to get out of the 96% and into the 4%. 12 minutes. So you don't, remember, you don't just reap what you sow, you reap where you sow. If you sow into Netflix and you sow into Hulu and you sow into the NBA and you sow into sports and you sow into the PGA Tour and you sow into all types of stuff that is not Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the Corinth. If you don't sow here, of course, it's not all that confusing why there's more fruit of doubt than fruit of faith in your life. If you only eat for 90 minutes a week. Not all that confusing. If the only time you open up your Bible is in this room, why the fruit of the Spirit is not evident in your life. Now, I forgot to say this last service, but back in 2020, the Holy Spirit challenged me and my team. We had started out as full-time evangelists traveling, and then Tom Hanks got COVID. Shut everything down. Didn't know how I was gonna pay my mortgage. I jumped into a doctoral program and I started a streaming service for theology and biblical studies. It's called ARMA, A-R-M-A. It's a Latin word for armor of Christ because every single Christian needs to know how to use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Can I challenge you? If you got a subscription to Netflix and Hulu and Disney Plus and however many else other streaming platforms, can I challenge you? I started a Bible streaming platform that's a monthly subscription that costs $10 a month at the cheapest, 21 bucks a month at the most expensive. Guess what? I want to challenge you today. If you don't know like where to start, I've got a course on Deuteronomy that's killer. I know you want a course on Deuteronomy. I know you do. But really, the book of Deuteronomy is the book of the Bible that Jesus quotes the most. So if we don't understand Deuteronomy, we may not understand Jesus. I'm a Bible nerd. Underneath all of the preaching is a Bible nerd. I would love to teach you the Bible. You can see me at the table. You can, if you sign up today, I'll give you a free gift. Super inexpensive and not boring. You can put it up there one more time. I think there's a word they should text if they want to join. Text ARMA to 97000. Sign up today. If you come to the table and show me that you've signed up, I'll give you a free gift. How about you make a decision? I'm going to sow my time a little differently. Our sessions, guess how long our sessions are? 12 minutes. 12 minutes. 12 minutes. You can spend 12 minutes with me every single day. I know you want to see me every day. I'm handsome. You can spend 12 minutes with me every single day and change your life. I promise you. Next, number four. Number four. Money. Money. Because if you said to yourself, I ain't going to pay for no Bible courses. There we go. Here's the next one. Money is a seed that you sow. Three types of giving in the Bible. Let's outline all of them. The first is the easiest. Even unbelievers can do it. It's called spontaneous giving. I hear of a need and I give. Unbelievers are good at this. Somebody dies unexpectedly. They didn't have life insurance. They start a GoFundMe. It'll go viral on Twitter. People will give to it. Because you don't even have to be saved to give spontaneously. Next is systematic giving. We call this percentage giving. This is the second level of giving in the Bible, but Pastor Rodney, sometimes this is where we stop. And we stay here for years. Systematic is 10% tithing. The point of God giving freed slaves a percentage that they're supposed to give is so they can live a life of percentages. Percentage giving should live, lead to percentage living. It does not glorify God if you give him 10%, but then waste 90%. Wealthy people know the percentage of money they give to housing every year. Wealthy people know the percentage of money that they invest into their own transportation or spend on transportation every year. If you go through a Dave Ramsey class, he's going to tell you not just to give systematically, but to live systematically. My dad took me to a crack house for the first time when I was five years old. My dad was incarcerated. My biological father was incarcerated for 18 years. My mom was pregnant by the age of 12 with my older sister. 
When I came into church and they began to teach on tithing, it changed my life because I did not have a father or a mother who could teach me how to budget my money. Uncle Joey, a deacon at church, set me down before I went to college and taught me, you give God 10, you invest 10, you save 10, and you live off 70% of your income. I've been doing that since the time I was 21 years old. And the, the gospel was preached to me. I was trapped in poverty. Being poor does not glorify God. My mom was pregnant at the age of 12. My dad spent 18 years in prison and spent countless amounts of money on drugs and alcohol. When I came to church and started learning how to systematically give, it changed my life. Changed my life. Because the church is not trying to rob people of money. The church is trying to teach you how to steward your money so that you can have wealth to give to missions and to give so that people can have life. I need a good amen right there. Interestingly enough, my dad, who had spent countless dollars on crack cocaine, went to the club every week. I had credit cards opened in my name when I was a baby. Terrible with finances. Came to the church and was like, see, they only want my money. The pastor got a Mercedes. I put my dad to the side and said, hey, how many packs of cigarettes do you smoke a week? Yeah, the executives at Winston, they drive Mercedes Benz too. You ain't never complained about that. The crack dealer in our neighborhood drives a Mercedes Benz and you financed it. You ain't never complained about that. The club dealer who you pay a cover charge to every single week driving Mercedes Benz, you ain't never complained about that. When I was two years old, you opened up a credit card in my name. The executives at Visa probably driving Mercedes Benz, you ain't never complained about that. You gave the enemy your money for years, and now you're in church, and you mad that God wants your money. You're a hypocrite, and you're a fool. Pull out your wallet and give to God. Oh, I'm preaching. I need a good Amen. Next is sacrificial giving. See, because tithing is only a start. Get this. If Jesus had only tithed his blood, we'd all still be going to hell. Which means the goal for the believer isn't even tithing. The goal for the believer is to live a sacrificial life. Is to give of themselves sacrificially. Money is a seed. How you use it is going to get, tell you everything about do you prioritize fruitfulness or attraction? Do you prioritize Rachel or Leah? Last one. Last one. Last form of seed is yourself. The reason that there are Christians all around the globe today is because a man named Jesus did not hoard his life or keep his life to himself, but sowed his life into the tomb, which was the ground on a Friday. And they came on Sunday morning, not to find a seed, but to find the fruit of hope and the fruit of peace and the fruit of resurrection, of resurrection life. The gospel is all about sowing. John chapter 12, you can put it up on the screens. Very truly, I tell you, this is Jesus talking. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and it remains only a single, but if it does, it produces many seeds. You want to know my goal, Pastor Rodney, as a Christian? is not to come to the church I like. It's not to come to the church that feeds me the best. It's to come to the church where I can sow my life as a seed and die so that other people can have hope and have peace and have new life. I was talking to a young adult recently. I said, like, hey, I haven't seen you since the pandemic. It's like, well, yeah, you know, church just doesn't really offer a lot to me anymore. I said, church was never there to offer anything to you. If you're a Christian, you're here to die. That's what you do. What do you mean church didn't do a lot for you? You're here to volunteer so that people who are drug addicted, people who are coming out of incarceration, people who are lost can come into God's house and find hope and find peace. It ain't about you. News flash. You don't attend this church because of the AC and the comfy chairs. You come to this church because it's a good place to die. That's why you attend this church. You're not here for convenience or comfort. You're here because it's good soil. And we declared that there's going to be a 30, 60, and 100 fold increase. That for every Christian who plants themselves into this local church and dies, that there's going to be a 30, 60, 100 fold increase of new believers. Come on. We declare fruitfulness over your life. 
My father took me to a crack house when I was five. And now I got a one-year-old son. How was I able to break generational curses off my family? I put myself in the ground and I died. I died to the spirit of addiction that was on my family. I died to the spirit of cheating that was on my family. I died because it's not about how you were born the first time. Jesus says you can be born again, which means I die to this life so that I can be born again in the next life. It's not about how I was born. We were all born into Adam. I was born with a proclivity towards lying and stealing. I was born wanting to be like Manny Arango Sr. And then I died to my pride. I found a therapist and a church, not one or the other, both. I found a therapist and a pastor and the Bible and I died to me so that my baby doesn't have to go through what I went through. Jesus' invitation is an invitation to die to you. Is this message blessing anybody today? Is this message blessing anybody today? This message has blessed you. I want to give us time to respond. Come on, we can stand up all over the room. We go back into a song. I want to give us time to respond. I'm going to be in the back. Well, really, I guess that's the front. I'm going to be in the lobby, praying for people, meeting people. I'd love for you to join the Armor platform. I really would. We have a three-hour course just on tithing because it's an area that millennials want to deconstruct. But if we deconstruct everything, we won't have anything. I want to invite you to be an Armor subscriber. I really do. But really more than that, I want to invite you to respond to the word today. If you're in the room and you're saying, you know what? My words have been a problem for me. I got to get my mouth in check. Come on, wave at me. I want to know who I'm pre praying for. I got to get my words under control, Pastor Manny. If you're in the room and you're saying, I've been crying over stuff that don't break God's heart. I need to get my tears under control. Or maybe I've been told that manly men don't cry. But guess what? If you believe in what culture says, you'll never shed tears in God's presence. If you don't cry, you're not sowing seed. The Bible don't say that. That's just what culture says. Come on, if you're in the room and you're saying, you know what, Pastor Me, I need to sow some tears. I need to sow better tears. Number three, time. Time. I need to be better with my time. I need to be better with my time. Number four, you know what? I need to be better with my finances. I need to be better. I've had a hard heart towards money and finances. I need to be better. I need to be better. Number five, I think we can all raise our hand for this one. I've been selfish as a believer. I'm a Christian, but I'm living for myself. Come on. In any of those invitations, if that's for you, raise your hand, I wanna pray for you. You can come down if you want prayer. There's prayer leaders here at the front who can pray for you. Come on, if you're in the room today and you're saying, oh no, I wanna respond, not just by lifting my hands, but I need to come forward for some prayer. Come on, the altar's open. You can come on down, I'm gonna pray for us. Holy Spirit, I ask that every single person under the sound of my voice would be empowered with your spirit to live out the word that was just preached. God, we don't just need a guest speaker or a worship team. We need the Holy Ghost to help us to live this out on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. God, we prophesy right now that North Church is the most fruitful church in the region. God, we thank you that we're fruitful, not because we're large, not because we're big, not because of the production. We're fruitful because we're faithful with our words, faithful with our tears, faithful with our time, faithful with our resources, and faithful over ourselves. God, we thank you right now. Come on, generational curses are broken in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you for increase in this church, 30, 60, and 100 fold. God, for every single person that has an area that was identified today, God, I ask that the Holy Spirit would continue to bring to their remembrance the word that was sown today. God, I thank you that your word is seed and that the seed went into good soil today. We say ears open, we say eyes open, and hearts are soft for the deposit of the word. Come on, and we say it is done. Come on, we say it is done all over the room. Come on, lift up your hands. Let's go into a time of worship.
Come on. Awesome to see those baptisms. Hey, if you want to be water baptized, make sure you sign up for that. We're actually doing baptisms next week. You can scan the QR code. You can also stop by Connections. They would love to help you getting signed up for water baptism next week. That's right. And hey, if this was your first time at North Church, man, I'm so grateful that you're here. You know what? You matter to God. You matter to us. And so all we want to do is just get you a gift, a $10 gift card, Chick-fil-A. Grab that North card. Stop by the Connections. Pick that up. We'll also make a donation on your behalf to Illuminations when you do that. So you get to be a blessing and be blessed at the same time. We've been doing Bible translation for the month of July with a goal of $100,000. We've already reached over $87,000. Come on, let's celebrate that. Let's make it happen this weekend. There's a QR code there you can scan. You can also mark Bible translation on any giving that you're doing. That's right. Did y'all love today? What, what a great experience. Hey. This coming Thursday, we got more revival experiences coming up. We have a great speaker, Chet P, is going to be joining us Thursday night. Then we got Greg Ford on Sunday. It's going to be incredible. So be, grab an invite card. Be thinking, who can I invite to be a part of this? And make it a point to invite somebody to come to church next weekend. Yeah, speaking of invite story, uh, my dad goes to North Church. Some of you may not know that. But just a few weeks ago, I was sitting on the front row, and I look over to my side. Dad's leaning over talking to this couple and like staring at them as they're worshiping. I'm thinking, come on, dad, leave these poor people alone, you know? It turns out, after church, I find out that he's the reason they're here at North Church. He invited them in his neighborhood, prayed for a guy, invited him, invited Ryan and Lily, their family, to come be a part of what was going on here at North Church, and they've been coming ever since. I love that. Good stuff. Should yes. be inspiration for all of us. I know it is for me to be inviting people. That's to right. He is a hero of the week, right? Yes. Well, we got a hero of the week that I want to celebrate. Everybody, Janice Tartabono serves in North Students, North Kids. If you see her, give her a fist bump, high five. Thank you, Janice, for what you do. Uh, man, I also want to remind you, uh, you know, our, our speaker is going to be out in the lobby. And so go out there, learn more about uh, the, the ministry he has going on, uh, and greet him on your way out. Yeah, you can also help us out by grabbing any trash around you. And then just a heads up, it's Revival Weekend. There's another large experience coming in for the 1130. If you are in a position to go ahead and head out, get to the car, open up a parking spot for us, we would appreciate that very much, okay? Thank you for being mindful of that and being patient in the lot as well. Let's say our vision together and let's say it loud and proud. It's on the screen for you. Love God, love people, follow Jesus.